My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today I'm speaking with James Hepner, the host of the Weekly Wins and Losses podcast. People from around the world find James when their way of handling losses just no longer works and when leaving 50% of life on the table is no longer an option. James's current client list ranges from well-known professionals and executives to average ordinary humans both of which are deeply hungry and curious towards the worthy work of breaking into and establishing a brand new dimension of life. Founder and creator of Weekly Wins and Losses, James helps people in their journey to embrace all of life, both wins and losses equally. I just had the privilege of being on James James's show, and uh, man, what a great, great conversation, um, and and. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on my show. Uh, thank you so much for having me on yours. Um, I'm looking for an equally stellar conversation, um, if not better, you know, because it's my show. And... <laughs> <laughs> That's so... nice. That's nice. <laughs> but well, yeah, man, thanks, man. Hey, you're very welcome. And, uh, you know, you are so kind and gracious with your words. I, I do receive. Uh, and I'll just have to nicely, not deflect, but just, you know, all, all honor back to you. It's easiest thing for me uh, when you find and spot a rare human being such as yourself to want to engage and to want to go deeper and go down the rabbit hole, uh, not to solve for similarity and sameness, but to engage. And uh, my friend, it was it was a pleasure. So thanks for having me here. Wonderful. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's start off in the beginning for you. So. Where were you born and raised? I know right now you're hailing from the uh, the great north, Canada. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, were you were you born and raised in Canada? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah, Winnipeg, um, to be exact, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Actually, a small community called Altona, and it's, it was in southern Manitoba. So for those of you who don't know where Manitoba is, it's the province, so Canadian province, directly uh, to the north of North Dakota. So. Uh, we're, we were kind of right hugging the line. However, it was interesting whenever we travel across the line into the U.S., people there would ask us, so do you guys live in igloos? <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so now we currently live in Vancouver. Uh, and of course, it's a temperate rainforest here. So the weather is more temperate. We have a lot of rain in the wintertime. But absolutely, we love where we are. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I uh, used to make weather a big deal until I ran into a life scenario that had me nicely shift and redesign my life. And uh, weather is to me weather. Uh, I'll be honest, though, my dream always has been to live someplace where I could be and walk bare feet or sandals all season along. So here in Vancouver, I can wear sandals all season long. It might get a little chilly in the winter months. It goes freezing temperature is zero, for example, it dips down to minus two, but typically it's, it's the plus three, plus four. So my banana tree outdoors, though, doesn't seem to want to really produce bananas. <laughs> but I mean, I knew when I planted the thing, I was kind of pushing the envelope. This isn't California, but I do like to look at the banana tree. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so what was life like growing up in, in Manitoba? Interesting question, right? I, uh, all the way I would answer that probably is what it was like for me growing up in Manitoba. You ask somebody else what it was like in Manitoba and they probably give you a different story. And that's perhaps the good news. Everybody has their own perspective. And uh, for me, um, Manitoba primarily is a farming community and there's smaller towns. And there's one city that has, well, the capital city is Winnipeg and Winnipeg has roughly 700,000. So that's a big city for Manitoba, 700,000 people. And so uh, some of the smaller communities around Winnipeg, so where we lived was roughly about an hour and a half from the big city. 
And apparently and it's the murder capital, to be honest, of Canada. So it's not, you know, and it's not like the whole Winnipeg is just is completely uh, full of killers. <laughs> it's just you go to the wrong place, at the wrong time at the wrong time of night, and you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of reality probably pretty quick. So uh, let's just say it this way. Uh, quiet, uh, probably quite sheltered. Uh, it wasn't just my parents that, that did a good job of sheltering me. It's, it's, it's just that's what it was. And of course, uh, when I was younger, and I just turned 46 this year. So back when I graduated, I think we had internet, but it was the dial up. And so, you know, there wasn't a lot of, you know, influence from the outside world per se. And people tended to kind of stay in their own tribe and group. And yeah, it's true. People would, would sort into, uh, into tribe and group. And there's a lot of religious uh, orthodoxy. Uh, and so you would often know who people were based on which church they went to. <laughs> so yeah, it was just a fascinating play, right? Yep. Were your parents farmers? Yeah, my dad was, uh, was a small farmer. My dad was a, also a pastor uh, of a mega church. So I grew up in the Christian tradition. And so uh, my dad never drew a salary from the church. I think they offered him at some point in time. And he was the bishop of, so bishop just meaning he was a leader of, of roughly, I think, 27 or 30 men. And so thousands of members. And uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that was his missional work. Uh, how he got by was through farming. So my dad had a mixed farm. He had pigs, chickens, cows. So we basically ate off the land, right? We, we, we uh, you know, we would milk the cow. We had about six cows we milked every day. And we had hogs, uh, which are pigs, <laughs> call them hogs. I'm not sure why, but so most of them went to market. So what the idea was, and I hate to say it, but you feed these animals um, as much as they'll eat. And so you ship them and <laughs> ship them so they can go to slaughter, right? And so, of course, we treated them as humanely as you possibly could. But knowing um, what, what today's standards are, I think we had a far way to come there. So anyway, yeah, they were farmers. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing your sheltered life, um, you know, maybe not as many friends and connections as you might have had if you lived in the in the big city but i'm sure you had a, a core group of friends mm -hmm. yeah i did that's a good point i uh when i was really young i um developed a and i thought it was a speech impediment later i'd find out in grade eight my mom had me set up with someone who came to the school and the person said actually you don't have a speech impediment uh, your brain just thinks so fast and your tongue has a hard time keeping up. <laughs> so, I mean, today I have a high functioning autistic boy. Uh, so high functioning, he can memorize a sheet of, uh, you know, document. Uh, he's in the 99th percentile, but he can memorize by reading it once, uh, typically. And then an older son, Rowan, who's 17. So Ro um, Rowan's 17, Harrison's 15. And, uh, and I guess I bring this to the surface. Um, I was quite hard on myself. And uh, in that that had me struggle. And so I, I would see that what I had when I was younger, what I had in relation to stammering over words as being a disadvantage. And uh, I kind of chose to allow that to separate me from uh, some relational connections, right? And so I would typically have uh, two close friends, but not really a group. And whenever a group would want to invite, I would find a way of just excluding myself so for example in high school uh whenever there was group work i would try to find a way of not being present and that was that's pretty difficult for me because i'm a pretty social being and i would go to the bathroom and because the reason i do this is you know in a group of course you have a greater chance of embarrassing yourself if you can't finish a sentence so uh, yeah i spent a lot of time my dad purchased us a new quad like a new four-wheeler and so i spent a lot of time just cruising the countryside and just wide open throttle is just dirt roads and gravel roads for miles and miles like straight you don't have to go around anything it's just straight because there's cornfields and grain fields everywhere and so yeah i did have a core group and i'm thankful for that but i i think i made my life um quite miserable <clears throat> and of course late, later on in life i came to embrace and just be like well if that's how it is then perhaps i don't have to worry about it so <clears throat> so after after high school we're you know where did life take you? I decided that this was the real life. <laughs> and so it scared the shit out of me. I thought I was ready for it. <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, this shelter, a little farm boy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, applying to jobs and thinking I should get every job I applied at. I mean, how is that reality? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and of course, everything, every, I mean, I laugh now and it's funny to observe back then. It wasn't so funny because 
uh, you know, the fear of rejection, it's like, what? So maybe when people don't want to have me in for an interview, that is basically revealing my worst nightmare come true all over again, right? And so to be honest, so I went into the workforce and I had several jobs. I think I got let go of every one of them. And uh, my sense of humor, I mean, I, I took things so personally. I was so harsh on myself. And, and um, I'll never forget, I had the first, the first job that I had was, I uh, was a gas jockey pumping fuel in this little community of Altona. And so there's this gentleman who owned the establishment and he went through a grand reopening. So he did some remodeling and, and uh, a lot of people from the community liked that fuel station. There was two and they liked that specific one because we were the ones that cleaned the windshield and there's a lot of bugs and mosquitoes. So windshields are always plastered when they come in. So us gas jockeys, we would not just pump the fuel, but we'd go and we'd clean the windshield and we'd scrub and we'd make it like pristine. And we had people come through and if we even missed a bug, they would sit on the inside and point to the windshield and, <laughs> and we'd have to <laughs> scrub all the more. Uh, but I'll never forget. So, so there I am and I'm doing my work and it's a grand reopening and the owner, which is Dave, I go to the, the till on the inside. I'm about to transact with the client to just take, receive payment. And there's a bunch of balloons in behind me. And so Dave, the owner, I guess was close to closing time. And he figured it would be a good idea to take one of the balloons off the stand and just pop it right behind me. <laughs> so it's just a joke. He just being playful and he was just having a good time. And I'd had it. I, I thought he set me up to lose, <laughs> you know? And so I'm like, this is the worst thing ever. And I remember I, I closed the transaction with the client. We, we did it. I looked over at him and I said, we're done. <laughs> and I just, I literally walked off the job. Right. And it's just like, I look at it now and go, what were you doing? And so let, let's just say it this way. I, I carried a lot of wounds and uh, you know, uh, yeah, I didn't know what to do with them. And so just fast forward. I mean, my story didn't end there. I worked at other places and, you know, let's be honest, right? I uh, like today I'm an entrepreneur and I have been ever since we're married. So I got married back in 2000, been with the same woman uh, for 27 years, married for 22, I have these two, two boys right now. And, and uh, up until I got married, uh, well, let's say a few years prior. So roughly till 22, so from 18, when I graduated high school to 22, I tried college for a week and <laughs> it didn't work. I tried about three years in after after I graduated and I was just reliving all of my past traumas of stammering over my words because you know I was still doing this quite a bit and uh you know and there was a transition point that came throughout all of that and it came when I met when I when I met my little Meg and I'll never forget there's a moment uh we were dating and you know I thought she's the cutest little thing ever and <clears throat> one night uh when I was going to leave I was standing in the foyer of her parents' house. And they lived in a little town called Winkler. And so standing in the foyer and for some reason, we've been dating for just a couple of months, but then all of a sudden, just like that, all of a sudden out of my mouth came a bunch of stutter. And I hadn't really done that. I don't think ever. And I couldn't finish. And I, and I started all over again, but I couldn't get beyond the first word. And I remember thinking to myself, it's over. She'll see that, th that I'm a loser and um, this is not working out. And Finally, I just stopped and relaxed my shoulders. And I and I mean, I was just going to lick my wounds and walk out basically, right? And I said to her, I'm so sorry. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've wasted your time, baby. And she looked at me and she said, sorry for what? And I said, ah, I'm not making any sense. I probably haven't at all since we started dating. I'm so sorry, you know? You probably didn't know this about me, but I got this thing. And <laughs> well, you just heard what happened. That's the thing. And she looked at me and she... And she just did this just came out of her mouth. It wasn't just like she was making it up, but she goes, I understood totally what you're saying. And I'm thinking she understood what I was saying and I couldn't believe it. And I thought to myself, you know, there's something beyond just our words. And that was the day when I realized that, you know, I'm giving way too much power to whether my vocals come out and by me expressing pristinely that that rules the show. Let's say it like this. I stopped losing jobs. <laughs> we weren't married yet. So I could, you know, I could hold a job finally. And, uh, and I, and I think leadership didn't threaten me because I don't know why it would threaten me other than it's just, I felt wounded. And so I constantly flinched at everything they did. And so we got married back in 2000 and from there, ever since then, I've, I've been an entrepreneur. So tell me about how this entrepreneurship came about 
what are what are some of uh your your wins and losses that really mm-hmm. shaped who you are mm-hmm. well i'll just perhaps and i don't think i've ever shared this before but uh not not at least not on a podcast um my entrepreneurship began when uh well, let's say it like this i I had met Meg and I was dating her and we'd already gone through that stuttering thing. And I realized she was a keeper because she apparently understood what even I didn't understand. And so of course I'm being more gracious with myself and, and I thought it'd be a grand idea, you know, the idea to move out of the parents' house and, you know, and, and, and my parents lived very conservative. We didn't have TV. We had none of these things out that, that, that was considered virtually and not by all account in that community, but for them, it was, it, you know, it wasn't needed and a lot of evil came through it. So of course I wanted to move out and experience a little bit. And so get, get myself a TV, you know, like, come on, <laughs> you gotta get a TV. And so I decided to move out. And, and so I had this idea, the winter hadn't hit yet. And, and not every winter was equal in relation to the, the amount of snow that would fall. But I was just thinking, you know, it'd be a fun thing. I had a snowmobile at the time. I had a trailer that I'd hitched behind the car that I had as well. And I could put the snowmobile on there and I could take it to trails. And I thought, why wouldn't I buy a snowblower? and start a little business and I just clear driveways and from that I would pay my rent and so I did I went to there's uh, you know in the states it's it was just a typical hardware store in Canada it's called Canadian Tire I went to Canadian Tire and purchased myself a snowblower and a grand $1,500 is what I spent at the time and I loaded it on the back of the trailer I was a proud owner of a business basically and I declared to my parents I was moving out I'd saved up from the job I had and I moved to a little town called Morden which was just a little further away from Winkler, which so for my parents to Morden is roughly a 35 minute drive. So I was still in Southern Manitoba and, uh, and it's close, you know, of course I was cl- you know, a little closer to where Meg lived, which is she lived in that town. And uh, I'll never forget, right? So that was a record year for snow. And there was so much snow that the roads um, took forever to open in town. Like the city just couldn't clear properly, big drifts. And one day I had this idea, you know, what would happen if I were to pitch new clients? I went door to door. And if I would say to him, hey, listen, how would you like your driveway cleared before the city even opens up the road? And I remember thinking this is going to open up conversation because they're going to be, how are you going to get here? And I uh, said, so, no, I'll find a way. And so I ended up getting landing a whole bunch of people. And I think they were intrigued with the concept, not thinking I could deliver. The only thing is they were surprised to see what I did. I took my snow, my snowmobile. And I, and I, uh, on the back of the bumper, I attached a hitch and I attached my trailer to the snowmobile and I would drive over snow banks with my trailer dragging in the back. The wheels are just like in the deep snow and my snowblower was on top of the trailer and I pull up at people's driveways and I literally, I clear their driveway and on the road, there's a four five, six feet of snow. So they couldn't get off, but the driveway is clear. <laughs> and so I established like this income source, which paid for my bills allowed Meg and I to go on some nice dates. We drive to Winnipeg and go to a theater and different things. But here's the interesting story. The story gets really, really interesting. And perhaps it shines a light on a bit of my personality. Um, Spring came and I thought, oh, gee, I'm going to be out of rent money quick because the snow is gone. (laughs) What's the plan? What's the plan? And I remember thinking, I was trying to concoct an idea. I had this snowblower and maybe the snowblower, see, it had a motor and if I would take that motor off and attach it to maybe a tiller, I could go and till yards. I didn't know. But I'm thinking to myself, well, how could I extend the snow season? So one day I'm watching television, you know, this evil box, of course, right? <laughs> and I see there's a snowstorm. And it was uh, the city about an hour and a half, I think Toledo, Ohio or something, an hour and a half, an hour and a half east of Chicago. And it's apparently the worst thing. People there don't know what to do. They don't have much snow. They don't have snow blowers. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a business opportunity. So <laughs> I, I mean, I was down in rent or I, I had a one month's rent left. And other than that, I had a hundred bucks to spare. So I, I called this gentleman. And I said, oh, well, he's just a younger chap at the time. And I said, listen, I wonder if you want to go on an adventure with me. He says, well, you know, what about? And I said, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to smuggle my snow blower across the line because you can't take something across the line. You either work in the States, it's not legal. And so I says to him, I, you know, I'm going to find a way of getting, getting this thing across, and then I'm going to come pick you up. And then you and I are going to go down to Toledo, and we're going to go make some, ba- like, you know, you know, yeah, we're going to go, like, make some bank. We're going to make some decent currency. And, but I said, here's the thing, though. I don't, have, I don't have extra other than gas money barely to get me there. So I got just enough to get me gas money there. 
and we're not really going to be able to eat a lot. So if you have some snacks from, from your mama's <laughs> kitchen, bring those along. And he was like, oh, fair enough. And so I, my dad had a truck with a camper shell in the back. And I pulled up at the Canadian U.S. border. I had, a, I had the snowblower back in the, uh, the truck and I drove across. They asked, they didn't, they didn't look back there. Just asked me where I was going. I said, I'm just going across to get gas. Left the snowblower, made arrangements with the gas station attendant, dropped it off at the gas station, came back, got my car, got the dude, the trailer, and drove with my car with a trailer that had nothing on it across the same border. And they asked me, hey, weren't you just here? I said, yeah, I'm just getting gas from my car now. I said, where are you going after? I said, oh, I'm just coming back. You know, it's not told truthful. I'm not, I'm not completely feeling great about this one. But here's the thing I needed to make. I needed to pay rent. So I got I had to figure this out. And so, yeah, he let me go across. I picked up my snowblower and away we went. 14 hours later, whatever it was, we didn't sleep a wink. We just drove all the way there. Stopped at gas stations and the beef jerky looked great, but we couldn't buy any of it. We didn't have money. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll never forget, we pulled up at Toledo, and uh, this is where the snow was. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't see any snow, but there must be a hill somewhere here where all the snow is. Like, perhaps a city, more of the city is on a hill somewhere. It's a massive city, right? And so we're getting fuel at a gas station, and there's this guy, he's just kind of like looking at our, our, our you know, my car, my trailer, and the snowblower, and he goes, man, what I wouldn't have done to have this a couple of days ago. And I said, I know, eh? this snow. I said, where is it? And I'm seeing water run down the street. But it, for me, I'm just in denial. I'm thinking, no, no, no. there's got to be snow summer because they said it, 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 it's snowing like crazy. It's going to last for a week. And I was still there in precious time. And he says, oh, no, uh, no, no. He figured uh, the snow is gone. Like this, this, it's melted. And I looked at him. And in the moment, what I said is, I'll never forget. I said, because he was really excited about my snowblower he goes we wish we would have had this here in the moment i realized what i had to do so i said to him this hey you wouldn't happen to want to buy my blower would you because <laughs> i needed money to get home basically yeah. and he goes no shucks bro like there we don't have that much snow here it's all good so so the funny part of the story gets gets funnier so we're starving by now, right? We're not making any money. And I don't know if I got money sent to my account for my parents, but somehow, and they wouldn't take my debit. We went to all kinds of establishments, banking tellers. Finally, a McDonald's took the card and I guess I must've had a couple of bucks. We bought one meal and we devoured that so quickly, realizing it'd have to take us all the way home. And actually we need a little extra. I sent my parents and they put money in an account. So I had money to get home for gas, but we, had, we're, we realized it's going to be one meal, maybe two, and we get home, but we had to really figure this out. And so we got the meal. We're feeling like, okay, licking our wounds. We head out of Toledo. And all of a sudden we hear the siren go off. <laughs> and there's a policeman behind us, pulls us over. And he asked me, what are we doing here? And I'm like, oh, shit. I just got to say it the way it is. Because I'm going, dude, this, is, this can't get any worse. Okay. And I said to him, hey, as you can see, we're from Canada. And we were over here to help the people bury up from the snow and uh apparently there's no snow and he goes you know you're not supposed to be working here and i said you know i never really consider that too deeply but well, i'm thinking okay we're just we're completely hosed he looks at me and he goes hey listen just take your car and point it home and get home boys okay <laughs> and so so we got home and so let's let's be honest like my entrepreneurship my days were interesting the beginning of but when we got married i started a company and we built uh, our company built single family homes and uh, we shipped them to different provinces, different states, uh, the community where I live, there was a lot of builders. And so um, the, the profit margin on building on site was super low. And so I thought, heck, I'm going to engage in a project. Why don't I do something that's going to challenge me? Like, really? And so we built houses that were well, 36 or 38 feet wide by 100 feet long. And so that's a sizable home for the area. And uh, so we found movers that would, so they had to close the roads half the time or lift hydro lines. And, and we found areas to ship the product into. And that was during the days when the U.S. currency was worth a whole bunch more than Canadian. So we attracted U.S. clients. They brought over their, their you know, the hard U.S. earned money. And even after move costs in between 50 and 100,000, they would still save about 10, 15% on a home build with us. And so uh, I would make a healthy profit margin of 30, 35%, which far exceeded the local market. So I was, I was just happier than ever. Right. So 
um yeah anyway so yeah we have to get inspectors in from florida different places they have to fly in because it's a canadian product and uh, it was it was quite the thrill to be honest right for me i wanted to challenge myself and do something that and i think to be honest the first half of my life was all about proving that i was enough right and i think i had felt so wounded and this is my this is my season i had the backing from my honey and <laughs> you know and uh, this is now the time to to make right and so i did well success financial success i was okay and things worked until they didn't anymore. So, and then of course we had to shift gears. Well, tell me about that. <clears throat> Cause there's, there's a transition in here somewhere where you end up becoming a coach mm -hmm. and, um, you know, start a mm -hmm. podcast, but there is a story to that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're getting to it. <laughs> hey, there you go. Two part story. The first part of the story is where you know when life comes at you i mean think about it listeners who doesn't have life come at you you know those of you who know david a little bit you'll know his story and how life came at him and so for me it ended up being a government audit our company had sold us personally a new home but apparently we hadn't charged fair market value it was an at arm's length transaction and so they they assessed uh, a few hundred thousand in penalties and taxes. I had the money, but you know how it is. You have an ear tag somewhere different and it's not, it doesn't match your preference. So what do you do when it doesn't match your preference? Well, for me, it was like, well, I'm just going to figure out a different way. And the only thing is the market. So that was back in 2008, roughly in that stance. So the market had largely collapsed. Uh, U.S. exchange also wasn't as beneficial. And so I had to pivot. So I was sitting at a spot going, oh crap, how do I do this now? what do I do? And I think I was beginning to feel like a fallacy. Like perhaps this is all just luck. Maybe it's all a fluke. And um, of course the audit arrives. I resisted for a bit and ended up paying for it. Uh, Rowan already was born. So Rowan was two years old. Harrison was just born. And uh, he, what was interesting is, I'll never forget Harrison's birthday or was it just after his first birthday? I remember, um, and we had already tested him, or we were going to test him, and uh, forget exactly the the the, the metric, the, the precision, if we had or hadn't, but we could see that there's something different with him. And uh, Meg always says he's differently abled, and so of course later on we tested that he had, they revealed high functioning autism, and I remember sitting at the table at his first birthday or shortly thereafter, and we had just paid the audit, thinking it wasn't fair. You know how it is. If it doesn't meet your preference, you, know, you can fall into victimhood pretty quickly, and you know, of course, I'm trying to pivot, right? And transitions are, they say, one of the most difficult things we as people will face. I didn't know what kind of transition I was going through. But I look back and it was, it was going from stage one of life to stage two, you know, first half of life to second half. And I remember sitting at the table thinking, why is it that we're all wrapping around Harrison? And we're not asking him to be different. We just let him be. Because Meg, Meg has always brought into her house that, hey, listen, if someone's different, why try to convince them that you're not okay and that you feel threatened if they're themselves? Why are we not saying you get to be you, I get to be me? And I remember thinking, you know, it'd be nice if I had that kind of treatment. If only one person would give me that, I thought. And what's interesting is I began to realize that my family was giving me that. But I had become so addicted to my trauma bonds. You know, the story of I'm a stammering fool that there was some deep inner work that I'd just been kicking down the line, hadn't been doing it properly. You know, and the success that I had propped me up to not see a whole bunch of reality. And I checked out of life. For two and a half years, I successfully found a way to sleep 18 and a half hours a day. I was the guy that would overdose on melatonin every day. That's the only way you can sleep that amount of time. I would wake up feeling refreshed, but let's just not be here. I didn't want to kill myself, but I didn't want to be here. So how do you do it while well, you sleep? There was days when I said to my wife, you know, I think I'm going to try to go back to the office. Like I almost lost my, my business, my investments, my relationship with Meg, family. But yeah. I'd say to her, I'm going to go to the office, but what I do is hop into the car and I find myself an abandoned road or farmyard. And I parked my car and I'd happen to hop in the back seat, grab a blanket and a pillow and I'd sleep. And so roughly at about two years into this journey, like, I didn't see family. Uh, I shut all 
all communication out. Basically, I was trying to think my way out of this, you know, like trying to really, really think my way through this and try to do it through eliminating, right? And so listeners, think about what happens if you're going through a story and something keeps coming up and you keep pushing it down, but it doesn't want to stay down. Like now it's coming up. It keeps coming up. Like in life, sometimes it works to push down, but then invariably what happens, we all begin to realize that if the moment says, the universe says, now you will transition and you will do it, whether you like it or not, in the moment, if you try pushing down, when you wake up from me for, from the sleep, it would be worse. And so it just got to the point where I didn't know where to leave myself. Like it was just intense. Again, no friend. I didn't see friends. People wanted to see me and I just exclude them, exclude them. So being very harsh towards myself. And I'll never forget my wife one day. Um, and she just said, you know, James, I'm here with you. And she was really kind. And she goes, I'm here and I'm here to support you. But you know, honey, my life also has to keep going. I got to go get groceries. Like I got to, I got to go live. I got to do something. Got to support her family. And I remember that thinking that life is moving without me. And um, what's fascinating, the catalyst to it, I think was probably the moment when I became aware that my family wasn't resisting me or resisting what I was going through. It was just that life is passing me by. And I was making my choice. I'll never forget, I went to a Tony Robbins date with destiny. <clears throat> and on day five is relationship day. And my Meg said to me, she said, and that morning, like, typically at those events, you get maybe three, four hours of sleep at night at best, because the event is long from early to late. And we've been there for four days. This is day five morning. I hadn't slept more than a collection of like a whole, uh, you know, you combine it all. I'd slept maybe five, six, seven, eight hours. But, you know, keep in mind, this is weird for me because I'm used to sleeping 18. And I think I'm dying because I'm, I'm feeling exhausted. This is the worst, you know. And coming from a workaholic, I mean, I completely changed. Apparently, I needed sleep always, weaker than a than a rubber ducky, basically, right? And she, so she says, hey, it's relationship day. And I said, yeah, you know, honey, I, I would prefer, I, I just need to sleep. And she goes, okay. And, uh, and then just before she exits the room, she goes, hey, baby, um, if you want to come, it really means a lot to me if you did. It's relationship day, but you can do whatever you want. I said, okay, let me just grab some sleep and I'll see what happens. She leaves the room. I close the curtains tight. I'm like, oh, my blanket, just hop under. It's going to be like, I get to just dive into fantasy land all over again. Don't have to, I can escape reality and, you know, grab for the melatonin and took about 10 of them like I normally did and took a gravel. I couldn't sleep though because the voice of her saying, it would mean a lot to me if you did. I'm like, she didn't say you have to, but it'd mean a lot to me if you did. And also I just jumped out of bed thinking this has got to end right now. I jumped out of bed and I thought, well, I was just going to go try it. So I go down. I missed about the first hour and enter the room and I'm looking for my group. My group, I don't know where the, I think it's color purple and they're sitting kind of in the front. So, I, you know, open the door in the back and I kind of sneak around the outside. I'm just going to get there. And Tony Robbins at the very front talking to somebody about, I don't know, Lord knows what, other than open the door. And he's probably just talking about this anyway. So it's not just about me, but he says, depression is the worst no, depression is the most significant and the most selfish thing you can do to yourself. It's learned helplessness. And he just keeps going. He turns around. He's walking like my direction and up the aisle. That's one over from where I am, but walking straight towards where I'm going, basically. And it, you know how it is if you're at an event and he's talking to everybody, but it feels like he's talking to you, right? So I'm sitting here going, how dare this mofo talk about something that I'm going, he has no freaking reference for how horrible this is. And of course, what do you do? You're owning your story so intensely, addicted to your trauma bond. It's like, this is the worst. Like, if you think your problem is the worst problem, you're pretty significant in that problem. You're not going to get out of it if you think like that, right? And so I find my group, I sit my ass down and then it's time for group work. And all of a sudden, all the trauma of doing group work in high school comes to the surface. Everyone's talking, everyone's want to include me and they're standing up and I'm just sitting there. And then I look around, I'm realizing I'm the only one sitting and they're all standing. And this is a very safe environment, very safe. And I'm going, holy shit. Because he had just finished saying, typically, I mean, clinical depression is a real thing. But he goes, I'll be honest, he says, the people that I meet, most people do depression. They don't get depression, they do it. You design how to do depression. I think to myself, well, just a second. Let's reason with this now. I'm no longer pissed at him because I think there's some truth here. 
And I'm like, actually, because he just did an intervention where he showed people, he goes, listen, you get into a depressed state and the person naturally drops the chin, you know, leans over a little bit and talks a little weaker and all this kind of crap, right? Crap, it just is, right? And uh, so I start relating with that going, am I doing depression? So it, it decentered me. It made me go, whoop, what? And um, that moment, basically, I'll never forget. I remember thinking to myself, well, I guess the news is out. I guess I know what it is now. Now that I know, I can't unknow this. But let's just say it's, when the, it's where the turnaround happened. And that's where I went from a life of desiring transactions. Like first half of my life from when we're married to the day that I entered that, that part of story one or journey one, it was very transactional based. I didn't know that I was stepping on people to get what I wanted, but clearly there was a lot of that going on. The second half, I remember when I came out of that tunnel, entered that second half of the game called life. Oh my goodness. It was incredible, incredible to experience that there's something beyond just having to do all the time, having to fix, manage and control everything. Something different than that. And I, I'll never forget um, making decisions. One day we, we exited a coffee shop and, and make it clearly see, and we were, you know, doing this, this this custom home business we're just sending homes into a different province not into u.s state at the time and she could see that i wasn't too too pleased as punch with the with the quality of challenge anymore and so we set, set foot on the sidewalk to walk home we were right close to where the coffee shop was at the time and she says to me uh hey baby why don't you just become a dude <laughs> i looked at her and i'm like what do you mean become a dude she goes what happens if you just like what happens if we would sell off all of our you know, our office buildings, all of the luxuries, a lot, sell off most of our luxuries. And instead of living in Winnipeg, which is fine, but why don't we go move to a place? You've always wanted to move to a place where you could walk flip flops or bare feet. Why don't we go move to the West Coast and we just kind of chill? And you become a coach, I become a coach. And of course, at the time, coach, I, you know, I've heard it and I had a coach and it was really nice. Um, you know, and I thought, man, this is just so interesting. And I said to her, yeah, baby, the only thing is we just spent a whole bunch of money on our corporate website and our office buildings. And she goes, yeah, and what does that mean? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, there's the invitation to let the transactional part go. And so it's what we did. We sold off and we let go of all of that. We moved to the West Coast and I became, and I'll say it, coach, I think is an overused term. I think often people associate coaches, apparently somebody who's wise and will tell you what to do. <laughs> and it's like, well, actually, well, what I, I think my definition of a, you know, of a coach is something like, and I call myself a strategist and the results, uh, self-help hacker. It's what they call me, a self-help hacker. I, I, you know, I look for the strengths of another person and I'll um, and I prepare ferociously before we talk. And then when we do, I'm just with a client, I'm not concerned about what I need to say. I'm just listening, listening. And then I tap into what I think might be a helpful modality. I've studied under a lot of people and we bring that to the surface. And of course, if you line that with the strengths, the human tends to have a unique experience. So that was a long answer to a very short question, but uh, that was a transition point of my life. And, and to be honest, it, uh, it was quite interesting. So, so stage two of my journey, let me say it like this. Stage one, by the way, was suffering. <laughs> I didn't know it before I went into suffering. But I thought I was living the life until I sat on the porch and realized we had the house, the car, all the stuff. Uh, and then, of course, I fell into this, this state. And I can hardly say depression because it's really selfish. I can't believe I did this for this amount of time. But the second half of my life, call it like this, um, you know, I don't want to make the first half sound bad and this one the best. I'm just saying I needed to go there, perhaps, to be where I am today. Second half, I just have an unshakable love with life. I, it's just, I used to fight the reality of life and say, why doesn't reality wrap around what I want? <laughs> but life doesn't work like that. Life says, you're going to have to harmonize with what's happening here, my friend. <laughs> you know. And so, uh, hey, I've just found a way and I've worked on myself ferociously and a whole bunch of grace and say it this way. And, lo and loving people around me that have um, just embraced uh, me and allowed me just to, to unfold. And so uh, let's just say it like this. I'm grateful for the moments and get to experience um, and be grateful for what I get to participate with, which by the way, what I have in front of me today is what I was given. So why try to flee being present here?
try to flee your presence never actually works. And so, yeah. I, I see how you made this transition and, and started, you know, this life of, of helping other people achieve more. Mm -hmm. What led you to start your podcast? That's a great question. Um, I don't think I've ever been asked. I've been on a lot of podcasts, but I don't think anybody's ever asked me that specific question. If I'd be totally honest, oh, I think mm, at least for me, you know, I tend to move quite quickly when I have intense pain. So when it begins to move to suffering, you know, I had remembrance of that from the first part of my life, right? And so it's like, ah, you don't want that. You don't want to activate the unhelpful side of suffering. You know, pain we'll all have, but pain to me is the acronym that I created is pleased accept inner nudgings. So if you don't accept the inner nudgings and the light on the dashboard's flashing saying, check oil, check engine, check engine, check oil, you're going to probably move from just simple a nudging and accepting to you're going to experience something a little more horrific. The engine may just go and you may enter a suffering stage. So I'll never forget one day I... I think it was about four years in, four or five years into me being a strategist for other people. And people would reach out to me once what they were doing wasn't working anymore. And, you know, and so they come to me, you know, most of them came because they're successful already. It's just that their fulfillment quotient was super low. And so I had done that work and I'd been there. And so I could relate with them. And so that's how I found my way into the market. And um, while this is going on, again, four years after I began, four or five years, um, I was a ferocious creator. Like I love creating like there's stuff going on. And I realized in order to get myself on trap, I got to put it on paper. So I just write things down and I create these, 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 these narratives and these quotes to make it simple. Like I love going into nuance work, not to complicate, but to make simple. So I go down these bunny trails and I write, 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 write. And then I graph it out. Then I make really simple so that we can understand just with a small picture, for example, or a couple of sentences, a couple of words and make them really like not big words, but that the average human in grade six could understand. And so I was doing this and I literally had a stack of paper. Like I, what I would do is I'd email these things to myself. I didn't want to forget what I'd done. And I'd print them off and I had a stack of paper, um, like a ream, it was like 500 sheets. I had this, this massive stack and I, I thought someday it's going to enter a book. It's going to do something. I don't know what, you know, and I would reread these things to make sure I wasn't forgetting it. And then I thought, James, okay, wait a minute. One day I was laying in the sauna and I was like overwhelmed with all of what I had created thinking, what happens if you're going to forget it? And I thought, and I was just like in my brain. And then I thought, wait a minute, what if there's better news and you being worried about forgetting? What about forgetting is actually a good thing? And I thought, oh no, no, I don't want to think of this. I've done all this work. So I'm going to forget. And what was fascinating is I thought, well, let's just play with this. So as I'm laying in the sauna, um, I had, you know, I had the window cracked, uh, and I, you know, so I had a bit of a lab created for my biohacking gear window was cracked and I can hear the birds chirping outside. And there's one bird as early in the morning, 5.00 AM sun is beginning to come up is making the sound and it just make the same tweet over and over and over again. And I thought, you know, what's funny. That bird doesn't seem too restless about making the same sound every day. It does the same thing. It's not too worried about the rest. And I thought, what's my one sound? I thought, yeah, I got a lot of sounds. And I said, well, actually, how about if this all is actually one sound and it's actually all of me? And so I don't need to worry about forgetting it. Perhaps forgetting what I wrote down is going to allow me to experience it. Because why just write it down? Why not experience what you're going through and really enjoy it instead of thinking, well, what is what what purpose is this? What purpose? And so I played with that for a while and that felt really nice for me. But then I remember I came to this moment where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I love creating. I do like, and so what's the purpose of? And I just remember one day writing down purposeful art, art with a purpose. And so, you know, I like to think of myself as an artisan of experience. I like to bring experience to people. Um, and here's the thing. One day when contemplating, what was the thing to do? Was it to write a book? Was it to bring forward this stuff in a written form? What was it? And I honestly just said, hey, listen, you know what? I want to experience the fullness of it all. And I want to experience who James is on the inside. And I want to experience in real time because I realized I was getting really, really high. You know, I kind of really, honestly, I get off on it, on being in unfamiliar territory, standing on shaky ground, 
makes a human stronger. And I really get off to discover who's in here. When somebody asks me a question that I haven't, I mean, I prepare in life ferociously for life. But then I remember thinking, yeah, but how about your Freudian slips come up? And I said, how is that not the best news? I want to see who's actually here in real time. I want to experience, because it's like when I get asked to do a speaking engagement, I'll never forget in one of the first engagements, I stand on the stage and I look at the audience and I remember thinking, hope this makes them happy. <laughs> of course, you do that so and so long until it starts burning you out. You're like, oh my goodness, I'm selling my soul to these people. That's fine. You want to serve them. The only thing is, are you having a good time? <laughs> so I'll never forget. I went on stage one day and I said, listen, I resolve based on myself. I said, I resolve to have a good time. And all I'm doing here is I am just going to flex and flow and see what comes. I prepare ferociously and the audience will be the audience. Thank you so much. And if people want to look at their phone or if people want to come and enjoy me on stage, meaning if they want to not physically come up there and, and, and enjoy me there, but if they want to come and enjoy the party, join in on the party but I'm not looking for your approval. I'm not looking for any of this stuff. And so I think that's honestly podcasting has done that. And, and, and you know, the title of the podcast weekly wins and losses, it's specifically in alignment uh, with what my journey was about. I was resisting uh, the gain of what a loss actually is. A loss isn't negative. It doesn't need to be turned to positive because it isn't negative. A loss is just, Typically, think about it, the happily ever after story, the Hollywood movie where the rose is given. We all know that's not the end. <laughs> that's the beginning, my friends. That's the beginning. So here's the thing. There's a real probability. Let's just talk, say it like this. <laughs> Listeners, there's an inevitability that wherever you touch, it's not going to turn out exactly as you thought. And because it doesn't turn out exactly as you thought, you're going to feel like there's a bit of a loss in pretty much everything you do. Now, it's not a perceived loss. And maybe it is a real loss, whatever it ends up being, you're going to feel like there's a death of something. You thought your business was going to hit marker X, it did triple or it did half or nothing. You thought marriage would make this, it was better, it was worse, about the same, but a little different, <laughs> you know, always different, always different, right? And so um, I've just pinpointed that and, you know, the term weekly wins and losses, you know, the reason that I, I brought that strategically into the picture Again, because people, we tend to see life through that lens. I mean, that's a very a primary and pr a primitive, perhaps, stance. You know, we see it through this lens, and there's a higher level of development. But the brain, typically, the patterning is, you know, think about fight or flight. You know, these are things where we are conditioned like this. And so we often like to label it. Is it good or is it bad? Okay, if it's good, I want more of it. Bad, I want less of it. And so when we take courageous action towards something, like I'm going to ask her to marry me. I got a client now that's planning to take company public. And so it brings out a bunch of fear. But if you've kicked the can down the line on where you've all lost and you've never really just faced it, removed the sting of it by facing to it, you're going to actually be afraid of your fear. When in reality, it's like Bruce Springsteen. Years ago, he was in the green room and there's opening band there with him and their knees were shaking. And they looked at him and they said, it must be nice to be you. You're ready to go. And he says, how so? And they said, well, look at you. You're all calm. You're relaxed. Look at us. We're just like shaking like a leaf. And he says, well, just a second. How do you know what happens to me before I get on stage? You guys go first, but what happens here with you happens for me. And they said, oh, and he goes, yeah, you know, one day I realized, <laughs> and I'm going to invite you guys to realize, he says, but I just realized you can do whatever you want. I just realized that when my knees were shaking, instead of me going, I'm anxious and nervous, it's like my shaking tells me and I'm now ready. And so when you face towards your fear, when you face towards your loss, in the beginning, it feels like, oh, this is the worst. But actually, give it the truth that it is. Energy that flows in you can either be moved towards, I'm afraid of my fear, or it can just be dance with your fear, which is anticipation. That's a helpful fear. Like, what's going to happen? I don't know. It's like this. I don't know what's going to happen. So I think that was the trans. That was why I chose podcast. And I really honestly just wanted to connect in a real authentic way. And quite selfishly, to be honest, I wanted to see who was in here. I wanted experience. I had been living this guarding myself for way too long. And I wanted to do this in a public sphere, not just wait for speaking engagements, um, but do this repeatedly. And so I, I do podcasts on Wednesdays and Thursdays. 
uh, specific hours of the day, mind you, though, because of other uh, you know clients, of course, one on one coaching clients. But um, yeah, when I say selfishly, uh, but also really, I decided this year was going to be the year of collaboration, the power of two. I didn't know how it was going to play out, but this is the year when I finally decided to amp it up. So I got probably, I don't know, 30, 40 ready to drop podcasts that have been you know, recorded. I got 20 that I, that I posted that I have just been me on and I've had my family on because I want people to know who I really am, not just my accolades, but want them to see who faults and all who this James guy is. Um, cause I never want people to have the illusion that I got it all figured out because let me be honest, if that's a coach, I'm not a coach. <laughs> I'm just a human. I'm just walking this journey. And there are maybe some perspectives that I've gleaned from life, but, uh, that doesn't give me, um, permission at, at all and ever to walk past someone's uniqueness. Right. And so I, I just really, I've loved it. It's been, it's been such a blessing. It's been, some people say, are you monetizing it? I said, my intention never was. So I'm not worried about this, right? Yeah. So I'm I'm curious. You you have a, a really awesome relationship with your sons. Two different relationships. Uh, we talked about that a little bit before. Um, when when you're old and gray, mm -hmm. and your sons are sitting around talking about, you know, the good old days with dad. And this is, you know, this is the best lesson that he ever taught me mm. through, through the perspective of each one of your sons. What do you think that story would be? I hope they say dad lived as a good man, the best he knew how that's all that I hope. I don't need to be Superman. I just want them to acknowledge that I did my very best with what I had and I didn't try to change other people or convert people to my way of living um but i just cheered them on and what is most profound to me and most probably one of the most important things is i want people to really feel and experience that i am so happy for the things that make them happy even though i don't i don't really enjoy that kind of work in life or whatever but that's that's my work to because part of what made me land into the suffering stage of life back like I said stage one of my story was it was all about me and now it's yeah me but not just me it's about listen there's more of me if I make room for more of others so that's my personality type right and so that's uh, for me to be humble yeah for those listening uh, what's the best way for people to connect with you? follow you learn more about you what's what's the best way so real simple they can just go to my website it's www.jameshepner.com there you'll find link to the podcast which by the way if you want to go directly to the podcast apple podcast or spotify or whatever channel you want may be on look me up at um the weekly wins and losses or sorry weekly wins and losses with james hepner that's the show title but again, on my webpage, you'll see the link for podcasts. You can click there and listen to it there, or it'll take you directly to uh, Apple or wherever you choose to go. And uh, for those of you, and there, there typically are a few that, and you'll know who you are, you'll feel it, who want to reach out to me directly and just have a discussion what it might look like to do some one-on-one -on -one work with me. Again, you'll find on that webpage, so again, that's J-A-M-E-S-H-E-P-P-N-E-R.com. Uh, just click on it, connect with me and just introduce yourself. We'll have a little conversation, no strings attached. Uh, and again, you'll know who you are because you'll feel a nudge. You're like, I, you know, I got to connect. I got to connect. I got to connect. So that's for those, for all and everyone else. There's a little gift. Every week, I have a no charge weekly wins and losses call happening on Friday at noon. It's a community call. You come and check in. We'll do a little quote unquote teaching about how to properly engage and utilize versus eliminate. Every time we eliminate, we create suffering. We kick the can down the road. You may not experience that suffering in your life, but your kids will because they have to deal with your traumas now. And so what it looks like to properly engage with the other half of life. Acres of diamonds that typically we tend to walk right past. And it seems like heavy work and dystopic work, but actually it's kind of fun. It's kind of light. 
when you see people on the show, we give everyone the opportunity and you can just observe if you like, but if you want, you can voice a win from your week and your loss from the week. And again, the sting seems to often just be removed after you say it in a community. And we don't, again, we don't convert any of the losses to a positive because it was never negative to begin with. We don't fix, manage, or control it. The part of the teaching that we start in the middle and how we end is it reveals that all of this is gain and all of it is good news because it was brought to you and it was brought to you for the inviting for you to harmonize with it. My story, my suffering story is one that people typically will experience in their own way if they choose not to engage with both sides of life. You think of a coin, you rub it between your fingers. The realness of a coin is what? Both sides are one, both sides. I want you to take that coin and slap it down the table and try to convince yourself that that coin is just the side that you see. It's not true. Pick up that coin, that coin, the realness of life, the reality, not the fantasy of the coin, but the reality of the coin is both sides. So unless, unless we learn to actively build an inner musculature towards turning your face towards both wins and losses, we're not going to start the next week off strong. Because all courageous action, all bold action requires that we have a real-time knowing and, 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 you know, just a realization that everything we do is going to probably bring us a feel. We win or we lose. That's the feel. And if we're afraid of losing, we're not going to action the things that fear us most. And honestly, the things that alive in any of us most are the things that fear us most. And so, therefore, we want to take courageous, bold action towards the big things in our life. And so at the end of the week, I dare you, I challenge you, come, enjoy, it's an experience, and I think you're going to enjoy it. So those are the two ways that people can engage with me. Or listen and, to the podcast, of course, yeah. And, and that uh, weekly call, is there a link on your website for that? Yeah, you just, uh, again, you can go to the website that I gave you, so the jamesheppner.com, and or you can go to www, and then just type in weeklywinsandlosses.com. So it takes you to uh, the specific page on my website where you just go down, you just click join Friday call and you'll, you'll ask for your name and, and, and contact info. We'll send you, and it's on Zoom. You'll see it. We have the Zoom community. And uh, yeah, you see people's eyes. It's quite, it's quite spectacular, to be honest. It's, it's quite the experience. And so it sounds really simple, but I'll tell you something. Uh, for, those, for those of you, and you know who you are, um, where you're just not content with missing half of life, uh, you're going to know who you are <laughs> because you're probably a little beyond just success. You're going, you know what? I can't waste a moment. I can't waste a moment. So welcome. Just come, come and enjoy. Nice. And that's uh, noon Pacific, correct? Noon, noon Pacific. So I think it kind of clocks out at one o'clock to be exact. I, I forget my, I should know this by now, but you know how it is with calendar. They just remind me to, <laughs> to do what I'm supposed to do, but I think it's one o'clock noon Pacific time. Correct. Yep. All right, James, thank you so much for coming on. I'll have links to your website in, uh, in the show notes so those listening can uh, easily find you. Uh, thank you so much, man. Hey, dude, it was an honor. And to talk with you is rare to have somebody like you in your presence, my friend. I, I really appreciated it, and I love your style. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.